Hello everyone, welcome to our video on the fundamentals of research in epidemiology, where we'll be providing an introduction to the core and adjunct areas of research. We'll briefly define basic research versus applied research, and we'll look at the role of epidemiology in designing a research study plan. Epidemiology is an interdisciplinary field that draws from three different fields, one being biostatistics. This was our previous video's topic, two being the social and behavioral sciences. This will be the topic of this video, and three being medically related fields such as toxicology, pathology, virology, genetics, microbiology, and clinical medicine. This will be the topic of discussion of our next video. Looking at the behavioral sciences, these play an important role in explaining health and illness. They often interact with each other and with other factors such as biological or environmental to impact health. Health-related behavioral and social factors also provide useful targets for prevention and treatment efforts. The NIH or the National Institute of Health has developed a definition of behavioral sciences research involving health and categorize this into two focused areas, core areas of research versus the adjunct areas of research, and we'll briefly touch on these within our video, where we will also compare and contrast basic research versus applied research and go through all of these components. But backing up and looking at the behavioral component of behavioral sciences and relating this to epidemiology, a subfield is behavioral epi, where the decision-making process is very important in understanding an individual's health behavior. From here, we'll go through and talk about various epidemiologic research components as well as study elements needed to conduct research in epidemiology. And we'll end the video by looking at some examples of application of epidemiology in practice. First up, we'll briefly define the different research areas within the behavioral sciences. The National Institute of Health, or the NIH, has developed two focused categories of areas of research, one being your core area of research, which can further be subcategorized into two, your basic research versus your applied research. Your basic research helps to explain, prevent, and manage illness as well as promote health, whereas your applied research is research that seeks to answer a question in the real world and to solve a problem. Basic research also provides essential knowledge regarding underlying mechanisms of behavior on three premises, one being behavioral processes, two being biopsychosocial processes, and three being methodology and measurements within the behavioral sciences research. So in essence, basic research is research that fills in the knowledge we do not yet have, whereas applied research is research that seeks to answer a question in the real world and to solve a problem. In addition to these core areas of research, there are adjunct areas of research, which as defined by the NIH, include neurological research and pharmacological interventions that target modifying behaviors. Looking at the neurological category, this can further involve three fields, one being neurology, two being neuroscience, where neurology investigates diseases affecting the nervous system, and the neuroscience investigates how the brain works with behavior, with our third field being cognitive psychology. This is where the conscious thought contributes to behaviors. Cognitive psychology is also known as behavioral psychology, and it is a branch that formulates theories underlying behavior through both observation and experimentation. Here we have four theories that link behaviors with health outcomes by helping to identify risk factors versus protective factors and patterns of health outcomes. Looking at our first theory, the contiguity theory, this states that a stimulus and response linked in time and space are associated. For example, a person gets food poisoning after eating at a restaurant and attributes it to the restaurant. 
the association is made between eating at that specific restaurant and getting sick. Whereas numbers two and three are the classical versus operant conditioning theories, which were first introduced by Ivan Pavlov with his famous dog experimentation, learning a new behavior by the process of association by which a stimulus has the capacity to evoke a response that was originally a response to another stimulus. So for example, a person gets food poisoning at a specific restaurant, the next time they hear that restaurant name, they become nauseous. This is as opposed to the contiguity theory in which a person gets food poisoning after eating at that restaurant and attributes it to that very restaurant. Within these theories, we have four subcategories that study the impact of consequences from a voluntary behavior. Specifically, four types of operant conditioning exist, positive versus negative reinforcement, where positive reinforcement consequences of behavior are positive, negative reinforcement, there is a negative stimulus that is removed due to behavior, punishment in which behavior results in negative consequence, thus reducing it, and finally extinction in which behavior discontinues due to the absence of reinforcement. Finally, our last theory, cognitive dissonance. This is where an individual's beliefs are incongruent with the facts at hand. For example, a person may love eating at a specific restaurant, but then learns that this specific restaurant is actually harmful to their health. Regardless of this new belief, they still love eating at that restaurant. And this leads us to our behavioral epidemiology research component, where the decision-making process is very important to understand why individuals behave the way they do when it comes to their health. To modify behaviors related to health outcomes, this requires an understanding of the laws and principles that underlies a person's behavior. Here, the process of making a decision consists of four elements, one being behavioral intention, two being decision to act, three being the health behavior in question, and four being the health outcomes that is expected. And it is important to note here that the general causes of human behavior are biopsychosocial. With that said, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a motivational theory in psychology that comprises a five-tier model of human needs that helps to further explain these causes of human behavior. I've pulled this up here and its premise is that human needs lower down in the hierarchy must be satisfied before individuals can attend to needs higher up. From the bottom of the hierarchy upwards, the needs are physiological, safety, love and belonging, esteem, and finally self-actualization. And so the purpose of research in behavioral epidemiology is to then understand the causal connections among intention, decision, behavior, and outcome for improving health behaviors and consequently preventing disease, prolonging life, and contributing to the dimensions of health. This leads us to our epidemiologic research, which is a very broad field concerned with providing a methodological basis for the study and control of population epidemics. Here it is vital to identify the important factors or variables that influence a health outcome of interest. With that said, there are six study elements that we'll go through to draw inferences from research studies conducted, whether they be causal inference or statistical inference. This will help us look at the various research components within a study plan. Number one, we have to identify what is the study question of our study plan. And with this, we have to identify an exposure variable as well as an outcome variable in order to study to what extent an association exists between the two. Number two, we have to measure these variables. This is the data collection step where we have to decide what kind of tools will be, we be using or methods to measure such variables. Number three is deciding on a study design. 
So once we've had our study question and identified how we're going to measure these variables in our study question, it is then easy for us to identify what type of study design we will be using so that we have a sampling plan for selecting subjects with inclusion and exclusion criteria. We'll further discuss this in our next video as well. Number four, we're going to be looking at the measures of disease effect these measures can either be measures of frequency or measures of association. This is something we discussed in our previous video. This is very important in determining the association based on our study design. Number five, bias. This is defined as a flaw in the study design or the methods of data collection or the methods of data analysis that may lead to spurious conclusions about the exposure disease relationship. Three general sources exist, one being pre-study, two being during the study, and three being post-study. An example of each is if bias occurs at the pre-study level, this can be selection bias where the selection of study subjects if the bias occurs during the study, this is known as information bias, where incorrect data has been gathered. And if bias occurs during post-study, this is known as confounding, where there has been failure to adjust for other variables than the exposure. This leads us to our number six, which is our data analysis portion. This is where we use biostatistical principles to derive mathematical models to explain our findings. Here we can also adjust for things like confounding via two methods, one being matching and two being stratified analysis. This is also known as stratification. So from here we'll talk about different types of epidemiologic research. Again, our next video is really going to expand on this, but looking at a broad overview. Here, the key stage of epidemiologic research is the study design. This is the plan of an empirical investigation to assess a conceptual hypothesis and turn this into an operational one via our research. There are two categories of epidemiologic research depending on whether or not randomization is used, one being experimental studies, two being observational studies. Experimental studies do use randomization of study subjects, whereas observational studies do not involve randomization typically. An example of this would be your cross-sectional surveys. Again, we'll expand on this definition in our next video on study designs. Backing up and looking at the experimental study designs, again, these do involve randomization. An example of these are clinical trials. So I'm going to pull up a picture here and look at where we have a source of patients that we've identified based on eligibility criteria and their consent, of course, where we can then randomize them into two study groups, one receiving treatment or intervention, the other being the control, and then studying them through time to see what the health outcome reveals. And with that said, lastly, we'll take a look at epidemiology in practice. My research specifically involves cancer epidemiology. And so I'm going to pull up a couple of my abstracts to look at everything we just discussed in practice. So the top study is on breast cancer, which is the most prevalent cancer worldwide. I've included the abstract for re your review, but just looking at the title, you can already identify exposure variable versus outcome variable. With the exposure variable being the anti-inflammatory dietary intervention and the health outcome variable being breast cancer recurrence reduction. 
Even though the study design wasn't mentioned specifically in the title, you can tell because an intervention is being used that this is going to be a type of clinical trial. And within this publication, I included all my baseline data that was then used for analysis and concluded that there was indeed an association between eating healthier and reducing the risk of cancer. The study below is on lung cancer, which is proven to be the most deadly cancer worldwide. Here from the title, you can tell that a pharmacological agent was reviewed in addition to chemotherapy in lung cancer, but the data was not collected by us. Here, data results were used from the I Am Power 133 trial, which was a famous trial for this pharmacological agent being studied in the use for lung cancer, making this study design an observational one where it's a simple lit review rather than an experimental one. And so with that said, we'll go to our black screen of spaced repetition and quiz ourselves over concepts from this video. Number one, which branch of research states that conscious thought contributes to behavior? The answer here is cognitive psychology. Remember, this branch does have four additional theories that we went through, which leads us to our next question. Number two. A person gets food poisoning after eating at a restaurant and attributes it to the restaurant. Which theory does this example refer to? This is the contiguity theory, as opposed to the classical versus operant conditioning theories, which are further subcategorized into four. And this leads us to our next question. Number three. This is an example of which of these categories, when a parent stops giving attention to a crying child and this behavior then stops. This is positive reinforcement. Remember, this is as opposed to negative reinforcement, punishment, and or extinction. Lastly, number four, true or false, Experimental study designs use randomization within their study subjects. The answer here is yes, this is true. And with that said, our next slide is an overview of everything that was discussed in this video. Please subscribe below, like and share.